Even a filmmaker who's pure in art and watches dailies at night may make a shitty remake when greed is full and the producer's wallets are tight. Psycho Nation, and welcome to the Scarifier Podcast, your podcast for all things horror and pop culture. I am the Ace. With me, as always, is the Gov. And before we get beaten to death with a silver tip cane by this remake, we're going to beat you to death with some current horror news at the news desk with Ace. Okay, Psychos, this is the news section, as always. Our topics come from iHorror.com, and starting off with some American Horror Story, the new season, season 9, 1984, the teaser trailer has dropped, and people, what a shocker, it's Friday the 13th. I it, actually liked it. It's Sleepaway Camp. No, it's a slasher. No, it looks really good. Yeah. Um, it's a slasher killer in a camp. Where can you go wrong? Absolutely. You know, well, we'll see. But it looks promising. It looks a lot better than the last couple seasons, I for agree. sure. I agree. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it premieres September 18th at 10 o'clock, wherever you are in the country. Moving on. Let's talk some Pennywise. It, Chapter 2. So we have no um, specific plot points yet. Everything's still vague. But we do know... How long the movie's going to be. So, for those of you keeping time, It Chapter 1 ran 2 hours and 15 minutes. It Chapter 2 will be 2 hours and 45 minutes. Taking from the trend that Endgame has started, Mm -hmm. people use the bathroom before the movie because it's going to be a long one. I mean, I don't mind long run times on movies as long as the movie keeps me engaged throughout like watching endgame uh that three hours flew by sure at least the first time i saw it um so if the movie's doing its job i really don't mind the long run times uh and with how long the book is i'm not surprised right just um you know think twice about ordering that supersized diet coke (laughs) yeah Okay, moving on. Deadline reports that I Know What You Did Last Summer, the TV series, Ugh. is coming to Amazon Prime with A-list director James Wan helming the plot. Uh, no other details beyond that, but we're getting I Know What You Did Last Summer, the TV show. Do we already have that? Wasn't it called Pretty Little Liars? Kaboom! You've been lawyered. <laughs> okay. So if it's Halloween, it must be Saul. Mm. Not. Chris Rock saw the remake. 
had a release date of October 23rd, 2020. That has now been pushed up to hit the summer circuit May 15th, 2020. Wow. So we cannot... Use the tagline, if it's Halloween, it must be Saw. That is officially dead. They must have some real faith in this movie. Apparently, they're excited. And uh, this is uh, not really movie news, but we are the podcast for all things horror, pop culture, and Halloween. So with that, another useless petition going around social media that never works. Because petitions don't do anything people stop wasting your time and putting your name on them but this one is yet again moving halloween from the traditional october 31st which it's always been to the last saturday of october gov your thoughts (laughs) i gotta tell you in the endless sea of useless petitions that you can find online this one made me laugh like, uh, well, this isn't the first one. They, it seems like the last three years this thing's been going around. Yeah, I know, but this one, it, this year, it has some traction, I guess. Lately, what was it, like ninety five thousand people signed it or something like that. If the numbers are wrong, sue me. Um, but it's it, it's so stupid. If you're a parent, which I'm not, so I can't really relate, but I, I can understand their frustration to have Halloween in the middle of the week, be it a Wednesday, a Tuesday, whatever. So I can understand, you know, kids have bedtimes. They have to get up and go to school the next day. You can't have them out at all hours trick-or-treating and stuff like that. I get it. (laughs) But you can't just change the date of the holiday. It's a holiday. You know, it's – I really don't know what else to say but, like, sorry – you know that you you can't have your kids running around trick or treating late at night. But again, remember if you're in October and you're on our side of the country, which is the New York area, it's dark by five o'clock. Get a jump on sure. it, spend a couple hours, and do your thing. Like you don't need to change it to the weekend if you have like big plans, like Halloween parties or get-togethers with friends, sure, do those on the weekends prior. No one's going to stop you from that. Why do you have to change the date of the holiday? This is just stupid. Yeah, I mean, I get, you know, to play devil's advocate, um, it's uh, kind of a compelling argument. I mean, I can see the point of wanting to do, you know, on the weekend, every weekend, um, or or the last Saturday of uh, every October, yeah, you know, you got the the trick or treating with the kids that you know makes that a little bit easier um, from maybe an entertainment perspective. From you know, as far as like uh, the haunted house business or you know that sort of nature, you know, you could really make Halloween a whole weekend event instead of just one day. Well, you know, but at the same time, you know. We've made it work for how many years since Halloween's been a thing? I mean, it, it, I mean centuries. Who, who, who cares? Cause you're, you talk, you're talking about a pagan holiday, you know, All Hallows Eve. I mean, again, you know what I mean? It's a it's a holiday. It, we've it, we've made it work all these centuries. Who cares? It, exactly. And with your saying, you know, the haunted house business or doing the things on the Saturdays, making weekends out of it. Fair enough. What's to stop you from doing that? I mean, well, no, no, they still do it, but I mean, to actually, you know. Now you can promote it as this is the the place to be for Halloween this weekend. I, I you, mean, you know what I'm it, saying? It, it just it, that to me that's unnecessary. And it's the, a good selling point, though. Maybe, but you know, it, it, it's ultimately futile. The world's not going to recognize a change of date for Halloween. I mean, again, it's always going to be October 31st. No, I agree with you. So just, I was ju- I was just trying to make argument for argument's sake, and again. You know, for centuries we've made it work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's no reason why we can't still make it work. Are See, there- I I took away from this as it's all just frustrated parents who don't want to bring their kids out on a Wednesday or Tuesday night for trick or treating. You know what I mean? I that's what I took it as. I didn't take it as like we're missing something in terms of celebrations because it's midweek, and you know. Just deal with it for a couple of years, and don't worry. Your Halloween will return on a Friday and Saturday. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Starfire. 
<laughs> All right, here on Scarefire, we are ready to sink our teeth into the 2010 remake of The Wolfman. Before we do, it's time for that production backstory. In 2006, Universal Pictures announced a remake to the classic Lon Chaney Jr. film The Wolfman with avid Wolfman collector Benicio Del Toro set to produce and star. Original director was to be One Hour Photo's Mark Romanek, who eventually was replaced by popcorn movie director Joe Johnson when Universal didn't share Romanek's vision for the film. After a long, troubled production that included several script rewrites, reshoots, and a continuing change in the release date, the Wolfman was finally released on February 12, 2010, grossing $139.8 million at the box office, coming over $10 million short of its production budget. All right, Gov. So let's uh, let's get elbow deep into this. Mm-hmm. So much to say about this movie. As monster fans, as the passionate monster fans that we are, we were obviously looking forward to this movie. Very much so. And one thing I want to say right off the bat with this, at least for me, I didn't come at this when I heard about this announcement and heard that they were going to revisit The Wolfman. I did not go at it with a cynical point of view. I wanted this to happen. Right. You know, it wasn't a case of, like, why are they touching a classic? No doubt the original is a classic, but I really did want to see this, and I wanted this to work out. So going in, we were going in, or at least I was going in, with all positivity, anticipation, and wanting to see something great out of it. Oh, as I was, as was I. You know, I look at it as if you were going to do any of the monsters, you know, as a legit horror movie, I thought the Wolfman would have the, you know, the best opportunity to really, really scare some people. Yeah. Um, Because a a werewolf can be vicious. It can be, you know, unrelenting, you know, just... I mean, and prior to this, what we had, we had, you know, the Brendan Fraser Mummy series, which was done well. I thought I enjoyed them. Um, I said that last week. They're, they're good movies. We had Van Helsing, which was a horrible mess, but that's long forgotten. So, and then when they were coming at this one, like it's not going to be an action adventure. It's not going to be a PG thirteen popcorn movie. It's going to be a hard R, vicious horror film. How can you not get excited? How could they go wrong? They went wrong. So, well, I, I guess the short conversation to start off with first is talk about what we liked about the film. Well, believe it or not, I liked. There is a lot I liked about this movie. I liked the feel. I liked the atmosphere of the movie. I liked the setting. I, I you know, I appreciated that they did a um, period piece in the Victorian era. I liked the acting. I thought that the casting of Benicio del Toro was spot on for Larry Talbert. I really liked Anthony Hopkins as Sir John. I thought Hugo Weaving was a little weak, but I liked uh, the backstory of his character being um, a failed detective from the Jack the Ripper murders was cool. Again, as a universal dork, I was able to very easily spot out all the nostalgia that they did hide in Mm -hmm. plain sight, um, including the little Europe village um, that's been used in every universal monster movie to date. Um, all the way down to you know the the steel ca- uh, the cane with the uh, silver tip. Um, the wolf head cane. The wolf head cane. Yes. Um, probably by far the one thing that you know gives any redemption for this movie, the incredible the Academy Award winning makeup by Mr. Rick Baker. Mm-hmm. I liked how vicious they portrayed the Wolfman as he should be. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the Werewolf Man was. I mean, you saw blood and he tore them apart, and it was scary. Mm-hmm. I appreciated that. Um, I thought Danny Elfman did a great job with the, the music. Um, as a Universal guy, I kind of. Hope that he would have homaged um, the original score a little bit, but 
it was still a good score. It kept uh, kept you in the mood. Um, it gets it, hard. It gets hard. <laughs> well, no, it, it's not that it's hard. It's you know, because I did again. I really appreciated the practical makeup, which you just don't see anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, even back in. Uh, you know, nine years ago, you just, you know, CGI was taking over. Sure. Uh, so to see a practical makeup, you see real fake blood. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, the the scenes when it was uh, the wolf man uh, attacking villagers, mass, brutal. It was, you know, sure. you had some legit jumps there. No, they didn't. They didn't pull their punches. When it came to the uh, gore and violence, and in this. Uh, Benicio del Toro did a fantastic job under that makeup. Um, he really did. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll get into a little bit, you know, why I believe the movie failed. But Gov, give me what you thought. Uh, it's gonna what be, you liked about it. It's going to be a lot shorter than yours. Um, I liked the practical makeup. I'm with you on that kind of hard pressed to talk about anything else i liked um i on the surface i like the cast but i do have a lot of problems with the cast i'll get into that a little bit later um i liked the atmosphere of the film and that's not me saying that i liked the time era that it set i'm saying like the photography the fog the look the style i liked that it, it felt like a monster movie sure i'll give you that i liked little europe um Again, seeing that back lot set that's still standing today, you've seen them in every horror movie Universal's produced, and you've seen them in a lot of other movies that you probably aren't even thinking about right now. Um, it's a legendary set. It's great to see that again. I like that the movie opened with the poem, the classic poems. They didn't forget that. Uh, or I, the full moon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, even li- I even liked, you know what, when a, they did the black and white, classic universal monster logo yes i thought this is going to be great turns out that was the peak <laughs> was uh, was wait, the, wait. Well, hold on hold, let me finish <laughs> what i liked about it i'm saying i liked it um yeah when when i saw that i'm like oh i rubbed my hands i'm like we're in for a great remake and much to my dismay anyway uh practical makeup uh the set the atmosphere Man, I'm struggling. Uh, I do like that they incorporated a lot of elements of Kurt Siodmak's original Wolfman treatment yes. with the whole uh, Anthony Hopkins character going out to the mountains, the Alps, or wherever he went, being attacked by a vicious wolf boy. That's straight yes. from Siodmak's original treatment. I thought that was, uh, you know, class act. Uh, to incorporate that, however, there are other elements, and you can also bl- you can blame writing, you can blame uh, directing. It, it, to me, it shifted back and forth between they're either really big fans of the Wolfman or they have no idea what the Wolfman's about. There's kind of a unsettling balance between they either know what they're doing or they have no fucking idea what they're doing. But again, talking about the positives. I think I might be tapped out on positives, honestly. Benicio Del Toro as the wolf was great. He did do a great job. Rick Baker, you can't praise the man enough. He deserved the Oscar he got for this film with that makeup. I think that's about it for the Gov. Uh, Gov has a hard time with this movie. Okay, so why don't we get into cast? Sure. Let's uh, you know, tick them off. One by one, mm-hmm. and um, give a good assessment. So, let's start off ba- with based the- on their performance in this. A lot of them are very acclaimed, very well accomplished, talented actors. I don't think there's really a misstep in terms of casting, but there's something a little off about their performances in this one. And I'm talking about all of them. I agree. So let's start uh, right with the star, Benicio del Toro. Sure. What are we thinking? What am I thinking? I I think that, as we both agreed, as the Wolfman, as the actual beast, he was great. He was probably one of the best werewolf performances I've seen in a very long time. 
And after this movie, we had to suffer through Taylor Lautner and his Twilight greasy <laughs> abs and stuff like that. So uh, I, it's easy to say last great werewolf performance. Um, however, as Larry Talbot, or as he's referred to in this movie, Lawrence Talbot, because abbreviated names, I guess, didn't exist in 1890, um, he was dull as a rock, I thought, and it's very, very interesting choice that Benicio Del Toro made. I don't think he was tired. I don't think he was just phoning in a performance. I think he was making a little bit of a deliberate actor's choice to underplay this role, which is contradictory to every role Benicio Del Toro has played in his entire career. So maybe he just wanted to see how that felt for a movie or two, or maybe that's just how he saw the character. As the Wolfman, he was spot on. As Lawrence Tauber, put me to sleep. Well, I, I'm. let me ask you this. And, you know, uh, there, there's going to be no secret here that, you know, my biggest issue is with this movie is the story itself. Yeah. And we'll get into that, you know, with, you know, when we talk about what we dislike about the movie, but it's worth noting when it comes to Benicio Del Toro, does his performance as Lawrence Talbert, do you think that is affected by the script itself? Do you think he gets the script and, you know, given all the garbage that, you know, they throw into this Lawrence Talbert character? Mm hmm. Do you think that affects his approach? I mean, I'm sure it does. Uh, you know, actors interpret scripts as they interpret scripts. They make choices. They make decisions. And he, like I said, he, I believe this was a choice to underplay the role. I felt like he was almost doing a uh, duality type role where he's obviously playing two roles. He's playing... Lawrence and he's playing the werewolf version of Lawrence and he made the decision to make them distinctly different not just one is a beast but like everything about him is completely different one is wild and ravaging and killing people and crazy and is a monster and is an animal the other one is very slow very deadpan very glazed eyes lowered eyes and you could also yeah attribute that to the script he, this is a very different Larry Talbert. He's not a average Joe. He's not a happy-go-lucky guy. He's a very tormented individual from day one. But the one scene that kind of bugged me is that they're trying to c convince us that this guy is an accomplished stage actor. And when you see him do Hamlet, I don't know if it's in the theatrical version or in just the unrated version. I watched the unrated version. Uh, he's lifeless and dead when he's acting. So, again, if the script called for him to be a lifeless and dead character, yeah, I guess he nailed it. But for somebody to watch, whether it's the audience in the movie or the audience watching the movie, there's, like, no life to this guy. You know, right. Ch check his pulse. He might be flatlining. I mean, again, this can be all attributed to story. I mean, and as you said, you know, it was a troubled production with many script rewrites. And reshooting, yeah. And reshooting. It, it was a I mess. Mean, it was an absolute hot mess. So we both agree um, he was a great wolf man. So you, you, with that saying, do you think he did what he was supposed to do as Lawrence Talbot? In the context of this movie, I think he was. Really? Um, I mean, maybe it would have been different if they didn't focus so much time on Lawrence Talbot. Like, he... But he is, you know, ninety percent of the movie. Well, he is the movie. He is the Wolfman. Um, all right. Well, I the the biggest flaw with Lawrence Talbert, and uh, you know, I know we're I've been trying to save this for the part where we talk about what we really don't like about this movie. But it, you know, it, it plays to the character. You know, the reason why Lawrence Talbert, non Wolfman is such a hard swallow in this movie is because he is so tragic mm -hmm. that i mean and again we can say that, that, that we can say the details but we can just say he, he's, for the character yeah, he's, a, he's, he's a, such a tragic character he's a tormented soul from 
scene one. Yeah. Before I mean, before he's even touched by a werewolf. Yeah, and as Lawrence Teller, I think he did a good job for what he was given. He was a fantastic woman. Or, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Uh huh. He was a fantastic wolf man. And even today, if he was given a redo, I wouldn't mind seeing that again. If he was given a chance to do something that is more akin to the original story where he could play that type of character that Lon Chaney Jr. played, I think he probably could knock it out of the park on all cylinders, Larry and Wolfman. Right. All right. Next major cast member, our new Gwen, Emily Blunt. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Uh, again, uh, similar to uh, Benicio on this one, for what she's given, I think she's making the choice based on the script, based on the multiple scripts, based on the reshooting. I think she's doing her absolute best. Um, again, maybe maybe this is all what they were trying to accomplish here. This kind of like lifeless, you know, very tormented family. Yeah, you know what I mean. But like everyone, everyone who's you know, there's just no energy. There's just no charisma there, there's really nothing to the next cast member it was a right choice and i think i know i think we know who we're talking about with the next cast member we're going to talk about it was a t correct choice but for these two the two male and female leads i just feel like they could have just brought a little bit more life into it and again like benicio emily blunt is not a johnny come lately she is a very accomplished very talented yes. actress um, and she's really great in horror. If you don't believe me, check out uh, last year's uh, Quiet Place. Absolutely. You know, uh, fantastic. And in fantastic in horror. I see her as Gwen Cunliffe here. If Cunliffe's even her last name still, don't know. Um, just lifeless, you know, and glazed eyes and barely speaking above an octave you know you gotta turn your tv set up when you have some dialogue scenes here you know uh, again you know is it you know the actor phone phoning it in or is it the actor trying to make the best of a shitty script i feel like they were all choices i don't think i don't think they were phoning it in i I, th I don't think that they were disimpassionate about the project i feel like that this is what either the director or the producers wanted out of it. This was their, sure. what they were trying to accomplish. This is their, I guess, trying to make a horror atmosphere with these characters. Mm -hmm. Again, tragedy comes into play, whether it's in the theatrical version or the unrated version. But when we see Lawrence Topper doing Hamlet, he's doing Hamlet, right? A tragedy play about a father and son, right? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right. you know? Well, we talked about the son, so let's go on to the next character. So John Talbert, played by Sir. Sir Anthony Hopkins. Yep. Now, when I saw this casting, this got me really excited. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anyone can fill the shoes of Claude Rains, mm -hmm. easily, mm -hmm. Anthony Hopkins. Gov, what do you think of Sir Anthony Hopkins? Um, I was, on, and I was in the same boat as you uh, when I heard that he was announced as Sir. John Talbot, uh, I was ecstatic. I was super excited. If anyone could do it, follow the footsteps of Claude Rains, it'd be Sir Anthony. How wrong I was. Now, get, before I go on and trash Anthony Hopkins, let me make this clear. I am not trashing Anthony Hopkins as an actor, and I'm not even trashing him as an actor making the choices he made in this film. This is clearly what the film was supposed to be. I hate this version of John Talbot. Absolutely hate him. I hate, I hate, I hate Peter Pan! But, to my point I was making when talking about Emily Blunt's character, it doesn't really make sense for her or for Benicio to make the choices they're making. It makes all the sense for him when you figure out what kind of character John Talbot is for him to underplay it and for him to be lifeless. It makes sense. Probably hands down the best performance in the film. Sure. Is when they're in the crypt or dungeon and he's like, look at my eyes. There's they're awake They're I'm, I'm awake, but there's no life there or I'm probably butchering it, but you know what I'm saying? Right. That's probably hands down the best scene in the movie. The best well-acted scene, best well-written scene. So 
Anthony Hopkins was right in what he was doing in the role. I hate the character. I hate the role. Yeah, well, I mean, it's Anthony uh, Hopkins' character that really um, um, sends this movie down the shithole for me. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's what, and again, not bad acting. Mm-hmm. You know, bad writing, bad story, but he owns it. Sure. And, you know, and he, for what it was, he knocked it out of the park. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in our final character in this segment, a, you know, a beloved character from the original clearly didn't have the impact in this movie <laughs> as it was in the original. Oh, God. And you want to talk about next, no screen time. Yeah. Uh, Maliva, mm-hmm. played by uh, Geraldine Chapman. Mm-hmm. Or Chaplin, I'm sorry. You guys know I'm horrible with names. Give yeah. me a break. Regan. Shut up. Um... You know what? I liked her. And we didn't get enough of her. I mean, I was going to say the same thing. Like, she could have been a great Maliva if Maliva was actually in the fucking film. Yeah. You know? Um, again, She's in, like, what, two scenes? She yeah. Pa- she patches Lawrence up, and then uh, Gwen goes to her for advice. And yeah. That's about it. Yeah, I mean, and she was an integral part in the original huge, movie and huge part of it became an icon of herself yeah you know um yeah played by the legendary maria uspinskaya absolutely that's a name i won't fuck up no how could you because i'm a universal door <laughs> yeah but um you know again this goes back to uh the bad story mm-hmm. um how could you just kind of make a side character of a very important character. I mean, it's through Maliva that we know what the Wolfman is Mm -hmm. and, you know, and what can destroy the Wolfman and, you know, and she's the protector of the Wolfman, you know, you know, first through Bela and then, uh, through, uh, Larry. Oh, we don't have Bale in this movie. Well, oh, no, I, no. I, 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 I'm just saying in context of the original movie how important she was, and we don't get any of that. Because of the change in story by deviating so far from the original, it almost doesn't admit her. I'm surprised we got what we did. Right. Really. Um, you could have easily canceled her out. Sure. And, and who knows? Maybe there are those scenes in the movies, but they just you know didn't make it into the film. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, total swing and a miss, not on the actress, but on the production. Right. But, uh, another important person we need to talk about in this segment, he wasn't an actor, but he gave us our monster, the legendary Rick Baker. Yeah. And for everybody out there in Psycho Nation, I feel that Rick Baker is only second to um, Jack Pierce. I I put him way higher, and I know I'm going to get shit for this, but to me personally, Jack Pierce and Rick Baker are the are are the watermark. So Tom Savini, Stan Winston, Bud Westmore, um, all those guys. I can be me per yeah can be me personally. Those those two makeup artists they are the they are the guys, and that's just my opinion. And I mean, Rick Baker he make he goes on you know he makes Martin Landau Bela Lugosi for Christ's sake. Um, two people who look absolutely nothing alike. Yeah, so I mean, he gives us this incredible Wolfman. He uh, he sticks. To the classic design, but makes it his own, so he's not ripping off Jack Pierce. He makes a very scary, intimidating-looking Wolfman. Mm-hmm. Again, all done by, a, and I'm a practical effects guy. Yeah, you know, and uh, 2010 definitely in the it's the time of CGI. Mm-hmm. Um, it could have been so much cheaper to put gray dots on Benicio del Toro's face, but he didn't. Right. He did do it for the transformation scenes, but you know what? I give him a pass on that. You know, because I know as much as he would probably love to done 
a lap shocker, dissolves. A lap dissolve like yeah. the original. It's just in this era, unrealistic. Um, talk about unrealistic. Let's talk about how horrible those transformation scenes are, but I digress. Regardless, you know, what a wonderful monster. What a wonderful wolf, man. He wins it. An Academy Award for it. Absolutely. Deserves it 100%. Gov, talk to me about Rick Baker. I mean, what's there to talk about that you didn't already cover? I mean, I agree with you 110%. Um, All the respect in the world to those guys that you listed out, but, you know, the proof is on the screen. 100%. You know, the the accomplishments that Rick Baker achieved. Um, and and you can tell it's just it's all passion based. Yes, you know what I mean. It's and and which is the best part about this movie. The best part, at least, about the production of this movie is Rick Baker went running to this. It didn't really matter what the script was, what the story was, who the director was. He heard Universal is remaking the Wolfman. He pretty much volunteered to do it for free. Right. You know what I mean. And it, it, you know, and it it meant that much to him, and it showed in his work. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, I'm not knocking uh, Tom Savini, Stan Winston, uh, the Westmores, uh, KNB. I'm. They've made iconic monsters. Yeah. That, I mean, they've revolutionized the horror genre. But for this horror geek's personal opinion, you know, Rick Baker, guys, he is the man, and it, it's so sad that the the business had to change so much that forced him into what I believe is an early retirement. But I mean, you know, we do follow him on our social medias and he's still active putting out some really cool stuff all the time. Yeah. It is a shame that he did retire. And I I agree with you. Uh, he, He probably still has some more years in him to do this, but at the same time, I feel like he, um, he learned from his old mentor, uh, Jack Pierce, you know, who kind of waited until he was thrown out of the business, you right. know what I mean, by the refusal to change with the times. I think Rick ba- uh, Rick Baker recognized that he changed with the time as only as far as he could go before he just knew that there would be a day where his type of artistry is obsolete. And that's the unfortunate, the shitty reality of right. Hollywood right now is it is becoming obsolete. Right. You know, swiftly. Gov, you are in the batter's box, man. Tee off. What did you hate about this movie? God, what didn't I hate about this movie? This movie is just a hot fucking mess. And yes, it mainly goes down to fucking story. The story, I just... How bad can you screw up the Wolfman? Like, or how much can you screw up the Wolfman? Everything about it, like, is just done wrong. In terms of a remake, in terms of a retelling, in terms of anything, you want to tell a story about a man who tragically turns into a werewolf and savagely murders a a small town one by one, that's the footnote of this movie. That's the undercard. They focus so much on this father and son dynamic this father and son family tragedy to where it first of all it's done horribly because again you're looking at two lifeless corpse on the screen that have no chemistry no charisma and you're supposed to care why you know what i mean and again i get it they're going off of this father and son dynamic that was established in the original, but it was much different. Yes, they were estranged, but they were not this. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? They were not, you know, a horribly dysfunctional family where the father kills the mother, sets it up to look like a suicide, sending Lawrence Talbert to a psych hospital for all of his adolescence just for him to come back to investigate the murder of his brother to find out that, oh, shock, the father did it. To add insult to injury, the werewolf that bites Larry Talbert, dun-dun-dun, is the fucking father. What the hell are you doing? I mean, does that pretty much sum it up? <laughs> Well, I mean, as you pointed out, you 
took the tragedy away from Lawrence Topper because yes. he was already a tragic figure from the start. Yes. So when he turns into a werewolf, who gives a fuck? Yeah. Um, again, um, we've talked about remakes before. And the thing about remakes is you don't ever want to do a shot for shot remix. They just don't work. So, but you need to keep the spirit of the movie, um, of the original movie that you are remaking. And this story completely lost that spirit. I mean, imagine doing Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the five, you know, travelers, kids, whatever you want to call them. They stumble upon the house, but it's not a family of uh, cannibals. And there's no chainsaw. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's the Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre. The story is what kills this movie for me. Um, you, again, we just said it, and we'll probably say it five more times before the end of this podcast. You lost the tragedy of Lawrence Talbert because he's so goddamn tragic. Mm-hmm. And... The tragedy in the original movie was that this guy coming home, rekindling the relationship with his estranged father, just wanting to do good, is now cursed with being a werewolf, and he is killing innocent people, and he can't stop it. That's the tragedy. Yeah. But when you put in mother's murder slash fake suicide... um. <laughs> the electroshock therapy as a kid, the um, well, the waterboarding therapy as a kid, all the years Larry spends in the insane asylum because being tortured, being tortured because he he sees this suicide slash murder. It makes the curse of the werewolf obsolete because he's already so fucked up. Yeah, you know, there's nothing tragic about him being cursed with the werewolf now. Mm-hmm. What they do with Sir John. Um, making him a werewolf. You know the and the climax of the movie is a wrestling match between two werewolves. Come on, I mean, I mean, like, I, I mean, and this is, I mean, like, when I saw this film in the theater, and it got to that point, like when it, you know, showed us the obvious that uh, Anthony Hopkins was the original werewolf and the catalyst to everything that's been going on. And you got to the thing where both of them are in the parlor and they transform and Anthony Hopkins Wolf rips his shirt like he's fucking Hulk Hogan and this wrestling match ensues that ends with one of them getting launched into a fireplace. I started laughing. I'm like, where's well, the hidden cameras? This is a fucking joke. Well, I mean... And what you gonna do when Hulkamania and the largest arms in the world run wild on you? It, it literally went from, you know, a legit attempt at a Class A horror movie to a B-budget shit show. Really? It, and it looked at... And, and then you go from that to them trying to recapture the magic of the werewolf uh, stalking... Gwen in the fog in the it makes, trees. It makes and no sense. The levels are completely off. And again, you know, this could be a product of the reshoots and rewrites in the script. Could be. Um, and I just kind of like together to look like something interesting. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Faults in the story that you know. After all this bullshit, the main motive behind it all is that Anthony Hopkins is jealous of his sons. First for the relationship with their mother, and he's jealous of his first son's engagement to Gwen. I mean, this is just, it's stupid. It's so stupid. And, man, it, it, you know, we've said it, you know, in the news a couple times talking about the upcoming Invisible Man. You know, Why you, fuck with it so much? I mean, again, you like I said, you don't want to do a shot for shot remake. No, nineteen ninety eight Psycho with Vince Vaughn it or twenty nineteen Lion King <laughs> for current moviegoers. Again, it goes to earlier what I said in the podcast. I really couldn't tell if the filmmakers here were like avid fans of the Wolfman 
or just kind of like rented the video right before first day of shooting and picked out certain things that they remember because there are a lot of great easter eggs in it you know just a couple off the top of my head uh where they're looking at the telescope right you know and yes. stuff like that you know and um a lot of elements in little europe and the cane <laughs> let's talk about the cane real quick there's another really big fucking issue i have with the movie now, if you were like us and you saw this in the theaters in 2010... Where the fuck did he get the king? Exactly. And it that was the first time where I was like hit with a bat in the face. I'm like, what What the hell is this? He just walks into the house and he has a cane. He has the cane. You have to establish this cane. This cane is an icon of this movie. Right. You know what I mean? What we find out is that there is a scene that got cut out to where he receives... Um, the cane from a man on a train, not just a man on a train. Play, it's a man on a train played by Max von Sydow, yes. which would have been great for this film. Sure, and it establishes the cane. It's not as good as buying it from Gwen, like in the original, but it's serviceable. They cut it out of the film. Why? Because the producers felt we needed to get to the first transformation faster. Go right. suck a cock. Seriously. This is stupid. This, these are important story elements that you are choosing to skip just to get to your, you know, big wow moment. Right. I mean, I'm just again, floored by um, the horrible decisions it, of this whole movie. Yeah, uh, and you go back to the Easter eggs. You know, the scene, the scene after the wrestling match where he's chasing Gwen through the woods. Iconic. I mean, it was that was the Wolfman. God damn it! We <laughs> finally got to that it. That was the Wolfman. Yeah. And, uh, again, this Benicio Del Toro's Wolfman was good. Mm -hmm. It was scary. It, it was, um, it, it kept you on the edge of your seat. Um, I, I mean, anytime he was the werewolf, except for the scene with the wrestling match with his goddamn father, I mean, mm -hmm. he knocked it out of the park. You, I mean, you were terrified. Mm -hmm. I'm to a point. I mean, again, it's the Wolfman, but I mean, it, it kept you on edge. Mm hmm. And, the, you know, they, they didn't skip out on the gore, which is what a werewolf movie should be. It should be a lot of blood and guts and all that good stuff. Um, but, yeah, when it, it boils right down to it, the story just sucked so bad. The, it, I mean... The story was the, terrible. The, the script was terrible. The changes are just baffling baffling bad i mean why would they ever think to make sir john the antagonist of the film what I part mean. of that character is antagonistic i mean you want to talk about tragedy let's talk about a father and son finally rekindling their relationship and then this horrible tragedy happens to the son and then the father has to kill him Right. That's a Greek tragedy, not this, which they're, I feel like they're trying to masquerade as a Greek tragedy. Right. You know what I mean? This is hot garbage. And I don't care if you're a, you know, a, a film enthusiast or a film analyst or whatever you want to come at me with how horribly wrong my opinion is about Greek tragedies and about filming and about drama and blah, blah, blah. I really don't give a shit. This movie pissed me off. Sure. I, uh, but, you know, the, the old saying in art, I may not know art, but I know what I like, and I don't like this. Yeah. And it, it, it makes you wonder. Um, it really does, because it's uh, very well documented that uh, Benicio Del Toro, he was really uh, the steam engine behind this. Um, for those of you who don't know, Benicio Del Toro is a wolfman geek. Yeah. Uh, to you know, to the fullest extent, he's a collector. He credits Lon Chaney Jr. as being the reason why he wanted to get into acting. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, and he really put the gears in motion to make this movie happen. Yeah, and so you got him, and you got Rick Baker, who we all know his love and passion for the monsters. Mm -hmm. Um, what could they have been possibly thinking? Making this. 
I mean, I really don't know. There's there's very little, uh, you know, right. resources to back up the production of this movie. They really didn't do a lot. There are some interviews out there. You can find them on YouTube. There's um, some literature out there. Um, I mean, if I ever get the honor to meet Rick, yeah, um, th- this is going to be like one of the top questions I ever ask him. I mean, you're watching the making of this movie, and you're watching them shit all over the original concept of the Wolfman. What are you thinking? Well, I mean, you know, what's going through your head as you? I mean, of course, you know, at the time he's going to be a good sport, play along. You know, we're making a movie, we're making our own movie. Sure, he's going to, but now you know, almost. A decade after. Well, I mean, it, it could be a lot of different things. Maybe they thought they were making the right decisions. Right. Maybe maybe they thought they were headed in the right direction. Maybe they were all for it, and then it just didn't pan out the way they wanted. Maybe the movie was taken away from them. Right. You know what I mean? It, it was a very long and troubled production where multiple, as we keep saying, multiple reshoots, multiple rewrites. Maybe the entire film was taken from them. Maybe the only scene in the movie that you have of their actual original intentions is the final scene with Gwen in the woods. Right. You know what I mean? Because it does feel like it's from a different movie. Sure. You know, and uh, a better movie. Yeah. So it's obvious that despite the few things we really like about this movie, this was not the Wolfman movie we expected nor really wanted what would you have done what would you have liked to see changed how would you have handled a wolfman remake boy i don't think i would have done a remake no the wolfman never got its traditional sequel yeah i would have made a direct sequel like a direct sequel how many years later yeah well um i mean you could either you could do a direct sequel to the original movie, you know, based in the forties and the fifties, mm-hmm. or, you know, you can jump a few decades because, you know, the werewolf legend is that they don't die. Sure. So I mean, there's there's room to play there, but I don't think I would have gone. Um, I w- I think I would have gone a more retcon. Mm-hmm. I think I would have uh, more of a rebooted. You know, direct sequel. I mean, yeah. again, The Wolfman never had its own actual sequel. He did to a degree. If there was... A, he, he had the monster mashup movies. If there was uh, the closest thing to a sequel he was ever going to get, it's Frankenstein meets The Wolfman. Yeah, it adds yeah. Uh, Frankenstein and the monster into it, but it is a direct follow-up. It is, but it's not a, a, It's not his own sequel. Sure. Uh, you know, it, He's not the star of his own movie. No, and... You know, I've, and I've always said, you know, and much love to Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, but that first forty minutes of the movie where it's just the Wolfman, mm-hmm. that is fantastic. Yeah, you know, it doesn't get corny until the monster comes. It gets corny when the monster comes in. Yeah. Um. So they drop the. You know, I mean, I think they really missed an opportunity there. But yeah, I think that's what I would do. Now that I really think about it, I think I would have done a direct sequel to the original. Mm-hmm. Um. In some form or fashion. Yeah. And just made it scary. Mm-hmm. Um, kept the spirit of the original. Yeah. And done my own thing. Mm-hmm. You? I mean, I would have taken a shot at the remake. Uh, I, I would have done it one of two ways. I would have made it a period piece, but I wouldn't have made it in 1890 Europe. I don't understand that decision really at all um, with this film. I would have probably said around the time period of when the original um, film was produced. So you're talking early 40s, World War II era. Um, And I I would have played with, you know, maybe some of the more fascist imagery of how, like, Nazis and other, you know, figures and propaganda tools were depicted as beast creatures or beast man-like creatures and just kind of played around with that right. you can also do a lot of things about seeing a star on your next victim you know that yeah that links to the holocaust yeah so i think i would have fleshed things out like that if i were to do a period piece but obviously still keep it a wolfman movie or i would have modernized it i would have set it in today's time and i think i would have made it more psychological Is he really turning into a werewolf or is it a story about a man who is losing grip with his own sanity? 
I would do things like maybe for the first transformation, instead of literally seeing him transform, maybe he's transforming him, but it's a reflection in the mirror. So really he's seeing himself transform, but we're not seeing him transform, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you could have characters respond to him like a wolf or a beast didn't kill, do this, kill this person. You did, Mm -hmm. you know, a little bit more really play with, you know, the questions of sanity and schizophrenia and stuff like that but i would also you know give you the payoff at the end where yeah of course he's a werewolf yeah Yeah. all right so that gave you a taste of what we think about this 2010 remake of the wolfman but what do you out there on social media and the internet think well the internet movie database gives the wolfman 2010 a 8.5 out of 10 what so it's average uh Rotten Tomatoes gives it a 35%. That's better. Metacritic gives it a 34%. That's even better. And the creatures out in Google Land, 88% of them liked it. Wow. I'm disappointed. So, Gov? All out right. of five. No surprise, 0. 0.5. I, wow. I, I, that bad, huh? I really dislike this film. You, know you what didn't I, even get Child's Play 3. Three a point five. I know. I enjoy Child's Play three <laughs> immensely more. Why? Because it was a less offensive to me. <laughs> <laughs> I am a avid fan of the Wolfman. It's probably, if not my favorite Universal monster. It's definitely in the top three somewhere. You know what I mean? So, and with the enthusiasm and the excitement that I had going into this film, and to just be bitch slapped by a bland cast of characters. And a nonsensical, stupid retelling. I wouldn't even call it a retelling. Just a total shit show of a movie. Yeah. And that .5 goes all the way to my man, Rick Baker. And I'm also going to include the performance of Benicio Del Toro as the Wolfman in that .5. I have a hard time with it. Gub doesn't like it. And it gets worse every time I have to see it. (laughs) All right. Well... The ace is going to be a little bit more generous. Um, my uh, scoring is going to be based on Rick Baker, Benicio Del Toro as the Wolfman. And again, you know, there were, were scenes in there that I really, really enjoyed. Um, his first transformation is um, the Wolfman. In his first attack on the villagers, I loved. I loved uh, the second one where he um, rampages through the village. I loved when he chases Gwen through the woods. Um, it, you know, we got a vicious Wolfman, uh, despite the fact of a shitty story, which I appreciated. Um, there was some nostalgia in there for us dorks, um, classic horror dorks, for us to appreciate. So. I'm going to give the Wolfman 2010 a 2. Wow. It's generous, I, you know, certainly to you, but um, there were some things I really did like. All right, so wrapping up with the Wolfman 2010, Universal Pictures obviously wanted to shoot for the moon but missed drastically. Who knows, there is a roar in the underbelly of Universal Monsters that something bigger and better is coming, so maybe third time's the charm for the Wolfman. We'll see what happens, and we can only hope that uh, our monsters get their just due. Well, Gov, the Wolfman is over, so what do we do next? Well... It seems like everybody's going to be running to the movie theaters to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Well, us at Scarefire, we're cheap. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go to our computer screens, and we're going to go the opposite direction to The Haunting of Sharon Tate. Because it's free. And we're going to really pick this thing apart and see how accurate... It really is to be released on the 50th anniversary of that tragic night. Something tells me it's going to be a great biopic. For us at Scarifier, have a good one.